This is what we remember about Superstorm Sandy. The Jersey Shore in ruins. Homes knocked off their foundations. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the state of New Jersey, Chris Christie. And Governor Christie taking charge. People want to rebuild their homes. They want to rebuild their businesses. They want to rebuild their schools. They want to rebuild their state. It is time for us to turn the page to make sure that we get the state back to where it needs to be. That is my sole focus for the next year. Chris Christie became America's governor. In the eye of the storm was New Jersey governor Chris Christie. And rose above politics. I've got a job to do here in New Jersey that's much bigger than presidential politics, and I could care less about any of that stuff. Governor, Governor, thank you for everything. Governor Christie was widely viewed as the savior of Sandy. Even New York reporters like me were impressed. I write mainly about food, but living here, Sandy was a story I couldn't help but follow. And at first, it seemed great to have someone like Christie in charge. But one thing caught my attention, how eager he was to talk about all aspects of the storm, except one. Do you think climate change, rising sea levels, global warming, it, anything to do with uh, folks I mean, in this town and elsewhere? I have no Maybe in the subsequent months and years, after I get done with trying to rebuild the state and put people back in their homes, I'll have the opportunity to ponder the esoteric question of the cause of this storm. Right now, I'm dealing with people who are out of their homes, out of their businesses because of the storm. And candidly, I don't have time to deal with this. My main concern is getting the job done that the people have elected me to do. But is climate change really an esoteric question? Or is Christie leaving his state dangerously vulnerable to the next Sandy? You came here this morning to witness history. Welcome, everyone, to the inauguration of Governor Jay Inslee. Jay Inslee is the first political chief executive in American history to be elected principally on a platform of combating climate disruption. I while leaders in Washington, D.C. pontificate and procrastinate, Jay Inslee sees an existential threat that transcends politics. I've never heard of a politician making climate change their defining issue and then winning. This we know. Our world is changing faster and more dramatically than ever before. As a parent and as a grandparent, I cannot consciously accept the dangers of climate change for my family or yours. In Washington, D.C., action on climate change has been stuck in a political quagmire. Are things really going to be any different in Washington state? If the Republicans' response to his speech is any clue, it looks like the new governor has a tough road ahead. Activities are changing the atmosphere in unexpected 
and in unprecedented ways. That the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed. The amounts of snow and ice have diminished. Sea level has risen and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have... There is no more fire season. We have wildfires all year round. Climate change, extreme weather. Call it what you will. In our vulnerability to it. The 12 years of drought has left the landscape bone dry. We got any patriots in the ground? A new scientific report has determined the last decade was the warmest on record. Our world is changing faster and more dramatically than ever before. As Sandy barreled up the coast, Governor Christie made it clear to everyone that he was in charge, that he would lead New Jersey through whatever blow the storm would deliver. Mandatory evacuations are now in effect uh, as of 4 o'clock this afternoon for the Barrier Islands from Sandy Hook south to Cape May. The combination of the rain, the flooding, and the winds are going to make this a, a very, very difficult event to deal with. But uh, if you're prepared, let me assure you that we're prepared and that together we'll be able to, you know, weather through this. I'll give you the uh, definition of back. OK, oh, good enough. Thank you. These houses are maybe four foot higher than the river. And as you can see, they're in the river. We're at the moment now where evacuation is no longer possible and we're no longer able to come and rescue people. You can see the seawall here. You see the water spring right out the front. You know, we should get out of here. All right, just head back. Woo! I still don't think we can assess what's going to happen in the next six hours. It's not like this is over. OK, we have the worst six hours of the storm coming right now. I know that many people in our state woke up today to absolute devastation. I got nothing left. There are no words to describe what so many New Jerseyans experienced over the last 24 hours. Thank you. Thanks. We have a long road ahead of us, but I have complete confidence we're going to come out of this better and stronger than before. We're tough. We're tough folks, so don't worry about that. Right. I got a truck, guys. No town in New Jersey was hit harder than Union Beach. Sandy's storm surge put almost the entire town underwater and washed away 110 homes. Of the buildings that remain, hundreds more are uninhabitable. Local hotels are choked with thousands of people with nowhere to go. I give you all my love and prayers. Thank you. After such an unprecedented storm, many in Union Beach are wondering if rebuilding even makes sense. In six, we'll be 25. And just we have 2,600 people that still don't have a place to live. Give you an ICC. So we're working 12 hours. And if we have to work into the night, we do that. Next. Town engineer Bobby Berlue is facing the biggest job of his life. Ever since Sandy hit three months ago, he's been working almost nonstop every day of the week, helping his neighbors through the aftermath. I can't keep going back to the lady asking for more money. My father has gone downhill since this hurricane. It's going to be tough. Yes. He has to help them decide, rebuild or move on. There's the three options. Elevate your home, pick it up and move it, or do a demolish. Coach football for 35 years. And you know everybody who's having a problem, I either had them in school at one point or another, 
coaching football. Not sure so like. emotionally, it's okay. difficult. That's it. We're going to make a left turn onto Brook Avenue. All of the homes in this area, there's only one still standing. And there's nobody living on that street either. But there was all homes here. Wow. And how much water was in here? Um, at least four feet. Wow. So up to the top of the steps of a lot yeah, of these houses. Yeah, there's only one person living here. Pretty sad. And we're heading down towards, I guess we labeled it as ground zero. What do you think makes sense down in here, where you're calling ground zero? Do you think it makes sense to build or just give up? I really don't think the people are going to give up. But if there's another storm or a worse storm, same thing could happen all over again, yeah? Well. Certainly happened again, but I don't know. I need a moment. Yeah, you're seeing a lot here. But Governor Christie is unwavering in his message. He says rebuild now. He vows to get people back in their homes and to get the demolished boardwalks rebuilt before Memorial Day. So that people both in the region and across the country who come here for vacation now, we're open for business. The state's $38 billion tourist industry hangs in the balance. So you're just gonna follow the sidewalk all the way up top and I'll meet you in there and let you in. Oh, great, thanks. You're welcome. I'm here to meet Washington State's new governor, Jay Inslee. He's already being called the greenest governor in America. He's only been in office a few months, though, so whether he'll live up to that remains to be seen. Jay. Inslee campaigned on two issues, boosting the economy and addressing climate change. And he seems to think they go hand in hand that doing something about global warming will create thousands of jobs in clean Hello. energy. Hello, Hi. Jay. Hi, how, how are you? Lily, good to see it's you. Nice to see you. How are they treating you here? They are very nice yeah. here. When I came up, it, the sounds of Washington, birds chirping, yeah. I heard every... That's real, those are real birds, actually. I don't actually. believe it. I think they put in an audio track. <laughs> no, that's Thinking California, you... this is Washington. <laughs> we have real birds here. <laughs> well, you want to see uh, People's House? I do. Inslee is still settling into life in the governor's mansion. He just finished redecorating. This is a, a painting by my mom. Oh, wow. And here's one of Mount Rainier that I did. Oh, wow. You heard that George W. is painting. Don't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't know if you guys exchange paint colors. He calls you and he's like, you know, Inslee, I found out that red and blue make purple. <laughs> so there's our family here. We got some oh, bike that's riders. Nice. There's Connor here is number two son. And then we got Jack, number one son, and number two son. And this is number two and number three boys, Connor and Joe. Please uh, tell me you call them that. Number three. Number two. <laughs> you can tell this guy is obsessed with the outdoors. Bird watching, skiing, bike riding. So this is my pride and joy here. This is my uh, this is my Chinelli. So this is 32 years old. And then I got my new little my carbon bike here. So this is a carbon frame. And my new slogan is uh, carbon belongs in our bike frames, not in the atmosphere. So, I like it. That's our new slogan. That's Surging that's greenhouse gases are worse than predicted. Before he was governor, Inslee was a member of Congress for almost 20 years, and he was outspoken about climate change. We need real science, and we need us to have a clean energy policy. Thank you. But he tells me that that kind of bold action he hoped for never came. When I was in Congress, I served on the Climate Change Committee. This is a committee that's dedicated to finding solutions to climate change. Well, unfortunately, pretty much all of the Republicans on the Climate Change Committee refused to recognize the science of climate change. 
Lately, a lot of people have been taking a second look at the so-called settled science of climate change. There's clearly a dispute about the evidence. Science is apolitical, and yet politicians in our country started to look through this through a partisan lens. You know, who's for this? Is it Democrats or Republicans? The science is clear. I wish it was otherwise. Life would be easier, but this is a challenge of the ages. Thank you. Why did you feel that you could get more done as a governor than um, in Congress? Congress was this thing that's kind of glaciated at the moment, and I felt the state of Washington is a place where we could actually do things on energy, clean energy, and we're doing that. We're getting that started here. Plus, you know, it's home, right? This is, this is home. Right. But lately, Inslee says his home state has gotten off track. In 2008, before he was governor, the state passed a law requiring major reductions in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. But they never put a plan in place to actually meet those requirements. Do you have a copy of the bill? Yes. Inslee intends to fix that with what he calls his climate action bill. It would create a high-level work group headed by the governor himself to come up with a plan. The enviros are making one request on the language, the key section of the language you asked us to write. They suggested ensure achievement of emission limits. I think that's probably better language. Okay, and, uh, good. if you're good with the bill, I'll go ahead and get it to the code advisor. We'll start generating right. signatures. Right. But there's still one big obstacle. The bill has to make it through the Republican-controlled Senate, which is why Inslee is taking such a careful approach He's inviting members of both parties to join the work group and pushing to find a bipartisan solution to curbing emissions. The great things we've done in, in our country have usually been bipartisan things, mm -hmm. ultimately. Right. And we have a huge opportunity for Republicans to step up the plate and be leaders on this right mm -hmm. now. We need a bipartisan solution. We all need to work together to get this job done. Well, why do you think it's so hard to get action on this issue? I gotta show you something. So here's today's Olympian. And the, the headline is, CO2 level passes feared milestone. Reaching a concentration not seen on the Earth for millions of for years. For millions of years. How could you possibly have a headline like this and still have political resistance to taking meaningful action? It's also on position. page nine. It's there. I think it's, it's, it's there. there. But I think I'm not the giving issue. them a pass. I'm saying the issue is that people don't know how big of a deal it is. But like, here's the problem that I face. Mm -hmm. Even if I went to a legislative hearing and I held this up and I read this to some legislators here in my mm -hmm. state, um, their response would be, uh, it's just wrong. I just don't believe it. WNYC's Bob Henley asked Christy if the governor was discussing the increasing severity of storms with climate change scientists. No, that's over my head. In the months after Superstorm Sandy, Governor Christie treats climate change as nothing more than a distraction. When he was pressed, he maintained he's a lawyer, not a scientist. But is it really so irrelevant? Just 20 minutes from Christie's office in the State House, Princeton University is home to some of the world's leading climate scientists. Can a storm like Sandy, or Sandy in particular, have been caused by climate change? Can you say something like that? There are many factors that go into building a storm, particularly an unusual storm like Sandy. One of the factors that we're sure was related to and caused by climate change was the higher sea level. Princeton's Michael Oppenheimer advises NASA and the United Nations, and Ben Strauss is an expert on sea level rise in the United States. There's no doubt in my mind the damage from Sandy was worse than it would have been otherwise because global warming caused the sea level to be higher, made it easier for Sandy to push the water further inland. So more and more homes, more and more areas were damaged, were affected than would have been if the same storm came by 50 years ago warmer sea surface temperatures from climate change strengthen Sandy. There's a really simple analogy here. If you put a pot of water on the stove and you light a flame, uh, you're going to get a lot of turbulence. That's like heating up the ocean. You have more storms, more moisture in the air, more energy and more turbulence. Over the past hundred years, the ocean has risen over a foot on the Jersey shore. 
mostly because of man-made climate change. Without this increase, the worst flooding from a storm like Sandy would still be severe. And when you add that extra foot, the differences might seem small at first. But these are real homes and real people. In New Jersey alone, sea level rise put at least an additional 25 square miles of land and 40,000 people inside Sandy's footprint. And scientists project that by the end of the century, the sea level will rise another two to seven feet, which means that in parts of the state, even a normal storm could cause Sandy level flooding. There's a tension between rebuilding as life was and recognizing the future risk and building in a way that protects property and protects lives in the future. The reality is that we can't and we shouldn't put everything back where it was, in the way it was. But as New Jersey prepares to spend tens of billions of dollars rebuilding, it seems like Governor Christie refuses to take any of this into account. Governor's press office. Uh, good morning, this is Mark Bittman. I was hoping to speak with Marie Carmella. We're hoping to set up an interview with Governor Christie. Uh, she's not in the office yet. Um, can I take a message? Uh, yeah, I sent her a couple emails so um, she can find those, I guess. Should I leave my phone number? Sure. You know, and here's the house that we're coming up to. I'm doing an inspection on this one right now. Six months after the storm, construction is underway in Union Beach. Homes are being elevated to comply with new building standards that Christie rushed to adopt. I can't wait another 18 to 24 months. We're going to adopt these now as the state standards, and people can then begin to make the economic decision regarding rebuilding immediately. Governor Christie, he's been instrumental. I think he wants the shore to be built today, completely. He doesn't want to wait 10 years. When you go in these neighborhoods now, homes are being elevated all over the state. The problem is, though, if the sea is encroaching on those areas, it doesn't matter if the home is elevated. It creates a false sense of security among the residents that things are better when, over the long term, they're really not better. Mark Moriello is a former head of New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. He's also an expert in coastal planning with 30 years of experience. And he tells me something I can't believe. Governor Christie's new rules are based only on past flood data and don't take into account that extra two to seven feet of sea level rise projected by climate scientists. You can build houses bigger and stronger but if the homes are, are still located in very vulnerable areas, we shouldn't be surprised when they uh, continue to be damaged by subsequent events. What, so what would rebuilding right on the shoreline, what would rebuilding smart look like? Our suggestion is we incrementally pull back. You can voluntarily relocate folks so it can be restored as a dune or a wetland that can be more protective. We can't sustain this over time. It's uh, environmentally uh, unsustainable and financially unsustainable. Pulling back from the shore might sound drastic, but I'm on my way to a place that's done just that, a country where flooding is a way of life. Well, it's a uh, distinct honor for the uh, Senate Energy, Environment, and Telecommunications Committee today to have the, the governor of the state of Washington, Governor Inslee, here. In my uh, many years in the legislature, I can count on one hand the number of times the governor has come to testify in the bill, and that might be the first time the governor came to testify in the bill and got applause. So, <laughs> welcome to the committee. It's, it's early in the session here, so. <laughs> As the legislature prepares to debate Governor Inslee's climate action bill, things start out pretty friendly. The reason I've proposed this, this bill as I have is because I do not have all the answers, even though I've been elected governor. This may shock you. <laughs> this is an invitation for us to work together to come up with those answers. No one. But the Republicans have some tough questions. How do we move forward while not losing the manufacturing job base that we currently have here? 
how can you assure me that more rules and regulations won't continue to hurt small business in Washington? Washington State accounts for about one-third of one percent of global greenhouse emissions. Do you have a different number? But Inslee says the real threat to the economy is ignoring climate change. The potential cost of climate change has been estimated to reach $10 billion by 2020. That's $10 billion. These are real costs to real people, to real businesses, and it's happening today. Behind the scenes, it's obvious he's frustrated. This is the beginning of a conversation. We want to have this dialogue, so that's right. the way to think about this. But at some point, if somebody does really want to challenge this science... Right, then you're ready. Then I've got to right. say, you know, you're arguing, let me tell you who you're we'll arguing. We'll get a printout it's of that right me. now. It's not me. It's the National Academy yeah, I think of Sciences. Keith said he had it. So I think this is NASA. Some Republicans make it clear they don't believe climate change is real. They bring in their own witness to challenge the science. The global warming ended in 1998. That may come as a surprise, but I'll show you the data for it. What about all the claims in that temperatures are warmer now than they have ever been? These are apparently not true. Don Easterbrook is a retired geology professor from Western Washington University. Soon after this hearing, his entire department writes a letter disavowing his testimony. All the data that I've read and I have before me shows that particularly in the last 12 years, we've seen an increasing temperature. We've seen more records broken. This is the original data before they manipulated it. And what you're looking at is the data that has been tampered with by NOAA and by NASA. Is this a conspiracy? Uh, I'm not into conspiracy, so I have no comment on that. Soon, the Senate Republicans settle any doubts about where they stand. They pass an amendment removing all mentions of climate change from Inslee's climate change bill. Inslee's been in office barely two months, and his climate change agenda is already faltering. And Republicans aren't his only problem. I learned there's an even bigger controversy brewing, one that's dividing Inslee's own party. The Netherlands is one of the most low-lying countries in the world. Much of it is actually below sea level. I came here to meet with Dr. Jaren Ertz, one of the world's top experts on flood risk, to see what New Jersey might be able to learn from a place where too much water is part of daily life. What percentage of the population of the Netherlands is really affected by water? One third of the country is lying below sea level and about two-thirds of the population lives in floodplains. So about two-thirds of the population can be potentially affected by floods. The water is coming from the sea, the water is coming from the rivers, we have groundwater, and we have also precipitation, rain. So we have all types of floods over here. We had our wake-up calls, we have had our Sandy. Their Sandy came in January 1953. The North Sea flood inundated 10% of the country's farmland, destroying 10,000 buildings and killing almost 2,000 people. In the aftermath of this disaster, the Dutch went to war with water. They built the largest system of dikes and levees in the world to keep water out. But in the 1990s, they got another wake-up call. Climate change was causing more intense rains and rising seas. The result was massive river flooding that overwhelmed their defenses. The Dutch needed a new plan. They called it living with the water. We thought, well, maybe we should give some room back to the river, allow the river to flood, like it was in the past where there were no people living in the neighborhood. However, uh, there are uh, locations where uh, people live in the floodplain. And for those locations, it's really difficult to find a solution that both allows the river to flood, but also protect the people.
Now when you drive through the Dutch countryside, the landscape has been transformed. With help from the government, hundreds of people have been relocated. The ones who wanted to stay had to accept flooding as a fact of life. Where was your farm when the government came? This. This, this pile of rubble? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. It has given us information that there was room for the river. The people who live in the area, the people who live in the area, the A2 by the Rinshuis, to keep it dry. Yeah, because uh, only making the dikes uh, bigger and higher, that was not enough anymore. So they need more space to flood the water. These farmers built this giant mound of dirt and moved their house and barn on top of it. Now, during a storm, the land below is completely underwater. By letting more water into the fields, how does this affect the area around the farms? Polders meegebruikt voor het water is er een 30 centimeter puilwaterverlaging bij Sertogenbos. To mastermind their flood strategy, the Dutch created a group called the Delta Commission. It brings together politicians, engineers, and business leaders. And unlike New Jersey, they recruited climate scientists to help. Some people think climate change is something that's going to happen in the future, but it's already there. We are the first ones to sense the impact of climate change. Because whether others say there are question marks or not, we are so low-lying, the impact on us will be immediate, and we can't wait. So we will have to deal with climate change, we will have to adapt. It seems like New Jersey needs its own Delta Commission. And back in the US, I find out that they used to have something strikingly similar. Years before Sandy, the state formed something called the Office of Climate Adaptation. So why wasn't New Jersey better prepared? I found someone who says he can tell me. This is a regional issue, and a global issue, and a generational issue. Are you ready to power past coal? Governor Inslee is about to face what might be the biggest climate change decision of his entire term. One that will have global implications. Coal is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. But these days, Americans aren't burning nearly as much as they used to. That's good news for the climate, but for coal companies, it's a huge problem. So the industry has a plan. Export America's coal to Asia, where coal use is skyrocketing. They just need a way to get it there. And so they're planning to transport it over a thousand miles by train to specially built export terminals on the West Coast. And the two largest ones would be in Washington State. All told, it would double the amount of coal the U.S. exports each year. The debate over these terminals is engulfing the whole state. We don't need the increased greenhouse gases and ocean acidification these proposals will bring. And pitting environmentalists against labor groups. This is an opportunity to create jobs. Good living wage jobs. At public hearings like this one, the two sides show up looking like rival sports teams in matching shirts ready to square off. Let's move forward toward prosperity. Economic values don't trump all the other values. To push Thank forward you. would Thank be you. to commit a crime against the future. Thank you. All this poses a huge political dilemma for Inslee. Environmentalists and organized labor happen to be the two groups that got him elected. The question now is, which side is he going to take? Whether the earth warms or not, right now, we need to improve our local economy, grow the jobs, put people back to work. And I hope our governor agrees with me that we should focus on Washington first. If you look at Whatcom County, 15% of our population is living below the federal poverty line. We need jobs in Whatcom County. We need good industrial jobs. The first battle in this war over coal is happening here in Whatcom County, where they're planning to build one of the terminals. I'm 
out here supporting four candidates who are running from the Whatcom County Council race. A race for local county council may not sound terribly exciting, but when it comes to climate change, this just might be the most important election of the year. I'm on my way to meet with Brennan Zachovic from the group Washington Conservation Voters. His small staff is working nonstop to block the coal terminals. The whole point of this is showing the country, showing the coal companies, showing Governor Inslee that there's a political force behind this anti-coal effort. We're ready to come in and win elections on climate. This is crazy, but the first decision of whether or not we do these export proposals or not comes down to the county council in Whatcom County. This is small town politics, local stuff. Now if Whatcom County votes to not allow these permits, that's the end of the, the coal terminals. If we win these elections in November, Whatcom County votes no on the proposal, that's the end of coal export through Cherry Point. It's game over. There's some people who worked on President Obama's campaign right. that are coming out here to this little election. Right. We've actually hired the president's data team. Um, wow. People who do his, his targeting and um, help us identify who to talk to, who not to talk to, you know, when to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I think we've built one of the most impressive campaign teams that I've ever seen in my life All in for this, this little election. All for this little election. And if, and if If the United States were to halt all coal exports today, it's not going to stop the nations that are consuming coal to burn one lump of it. All we're going to do is export those jobs to other places. Herb Crone is head of the local railroad workers union. He's one of the most powerful leaders on the other side of the coal issue. You can come out and protest and you can feel like you're doing something for the world, right. but you're not accomplishing anything except costing American jobs. You're saying there is no free lunch, but your big concern is that there are men that you represent who have no lunch, and that's what you're trying <laughs> to focus on. Fam there are a lot of families with no dinners, right. and you know, there are a lot of unemployed construction workers. Jobs create jobs. The building of these facilities is going to employ thousands of people for several years. The railroad jobs are going to stretch all the way back to the originating point of the trains. Did you vote for Governor Inslee? Yes, our union supported Governor Inslee quite well. Yeah, you know, we talked to him about these facilities. Mm -hmm. What has he said about it? Uh, he said they have to be studied. I respect Governor Inslee, and uh, you know, we hope that he'll keep his pledge to keep an open mind. Mm -hmm. But so far, Inslee's avoided giving a straight answer about the terminals. We're still coming out of this recession. Job creation is extremely important to me. But I want to reiterate, we have not made any decisions. That'll be an ongoing process for years to come. I just wonder how long he'll be able to stay on the sidelines. Meanwhile, his climate action bill is nearing a vote. And the governor faces a tough decision. Is the bill worth passing if the words climate change aren't even in it? The question now before us is, sort of a cost-benefit analysis. Do we go with this bill that is less than perfect, or do we continue to work and, and fight over the language? If we wanted to get it out of the Senate, uh, we basically needed to avoid the fight. And in the end, that's what Inslee does. The bill goes to a vote without any mention of climate change. But in exchange, the Republicans agree to join Inslee's work group to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 37 yeas, 12 nays. Senate Bill 5802 is declared passed. And many of them thought the bill would die because we'd insist on the word climate change. We went ahead and just passed it anyway. This is the start of something big here. It serves a purpose, which is asking Republicans and Democrats to come to the table and accept moral responsibility for finding a solution. Inslee claims it as a victory. But once the work group starts meeting, I wonder if these two sides will actually be able to agree on anything. I'm meeting with Bill Wolf. Over more than two decades, 
Bill worked inside the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, studying threats to the coast. He says that long before Superstorm Sandy, there were warnings. Professional planners inside DEP for years had been talking about coastal vulnerability to floods and, and storms and sea level rise. And they were basically reports that sat on a shelf every two years for decade, for 15 year, for 15 year periods. It's about the mid 90s. This is a reaction this is to them acknowledging. Them acknowledging like, that the science of climate change projected sea level rise, storm surge, and increasing storm intensity. That, that when you map those risks along the shore, that we were highly vulnerable. Were those warnings becoming shriller, more harsh, more worrisome than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago? Absolutely. And, and it, was, it was almost as if the planners were running around with their hair on fire. For years, these warnings were ignored. But in 2005, Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans and changed everything. New Jersey leaders realized their coast could be vulnerable to a similar storm. And so Governor Christie's predecessor, John Corzine, created an Office of Climate Adaptation to deal with this problem. In the wake of Katrina, there was a whole burst of activity dealing with emissions reductions, coastal adaptation and vulnerability assessments for the shore. Promise of actual actions. Um, yeah, actions. And then, and then the, the Christie administration came on board and basically uh, systematically, systematically across the board, dismantled that his first hour in office, he issued four executive orders. And those four orders targeted the Department of Environmental Protection. And so coastal management policies and vulnerability assessment and adaptation policies, that was all nixed. No one knows what would have happened if Christie hadn't killed these programs. But without them, New Jersey was caught off guard by Superstorm Sandy. As a result, Bill Wolf says, the rebuilding plan had to be improvised, and it's fatally flawed. Where we're rebuilding, we are virtually guaranteeing to go through another round of exactly what we went through. But it didn't have to be this way. We can rise back from the ashes, and we can be smarter and stronger than ever. We can modernize. Just across the Hudson River from New Jersey, New York City has been making plans for Netherlands-style smart adaptation since 2007. Earlier this week, Mayor Bloomberg unveiled a $20 billion plan to protect the mayor laid out a 439-page plan to protect the city. The city even hired Dutch experts to help. Among the bigger projects are removable gates along lower Manhattan shorelines, storm surge barriers in Newtown Creek, the Gowanus Canal, and elsewhere, even a new neighborhood near the South Street seaport that would absorb rising sea levels. This is urgent work, and it must begin now. So why isn't Chris Christie taking any of this into account in his state? Kara, we're calling you again. Can I have Kara Walker's office, please? Hey, this is Mark Bittman. I'm just following up, seeing if we can get that interview we're trying to get with Governor Christie. Okay, uh, I'll have to follow up with you at the moment. Um, I don't have an answer for you just yet, but um, I do have your request on hand, and uh, hopefully we can touch base tomorrow. That would be great. You want me to call you, or you're going to call me? Um, I think I got all your contact information in the email. Okay, we're here for the uh, Climate Legislative and Executive Work Group. Um, as part of our lean management, we've uh, sold the gavel, so we don't have a gavel to start with. So we'll just start with, uh, with good intentions. As Governor Inslee's bipartisan work group begins to meet, the cracks are already showing. Between Republicans concerned about the economic impact of regulations. I want to be an innovative state but I am not gonna do it on the backs of Washington families. And Democrats concerned about the impact of climate change itself. Let's consider the impacts of ocean acidification in Washington state and the thousands of jobs that directly depend upon it. Meanwhile, the fight over coal in Whatcom County is creating divisions even among fellow Democrats. I want to know how Governor Inslee is going to handle all this. 
This is so beautiful here. Yeah. I've actually never been inside of a state mm -hmm. capitol before. I wanted to chip off some marble to take home as a souvenir. We frown on that, but we, I can get you some marble from somewhere, oh, really? just not here. <laughs> you frown on I'll that? I'll get you some Tonino sandstone. Um, when we last sat down, mm -hmm. you had just passed a, a climate bill. Mm -hmm. How has that been working so far? How happy are you with that? So we've had our first series of meetings, but now we've got to establish the plan to meet the targets. And we've set this up to try to do this on a bipartisan basis, Democrats and Republicans. Are you still as frustrated with Republicans uh, as you were before, or do you feel that there has been some movement? Well, the jury is out. So we'll see in the next few months whether they accept the, we've put our hand out to try to ask them to help us design a solution. And I hope they do. There's um, a big issue going on right now at the coal export terminals. Mm -hmm. You bet. When you ran for governor, mm -hmm. you had the support of most of the labor unions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's probably gotta be a, a tricky place for you to be in because you want to get the people mm -hmm. of Washington jobs, and you also care about the environment. So do you take that into your decision-making <clears> process <throat> when you think about how many jobs it could give the people of, of Whatcom County? Sure I do, and I'm very comfortable with my analysis of this because there's, there are some pluses from the job perspective for a coal port, but there's also some minuses in solar and wind and carbon fiber for, for planes and cars and energy efficiency. This is where our future is, and we're going to seize it. You haven't said out loud yet, I'm against it. Well, I am confident the voters of Whatcom County are going to know the ramifications of this. This is going to be a very hotly contested issue. People are going to know the carbon dioxide pollution that comes from this. It doesn't matter where coal is burned. Mm -hmm. The carbon dioxide that comes from the coal that's shipped out of Washington, burned in China, ends up in Puget Sound. It ends up changing the climate. And while Inslee won't tell me flat out that he's against the terminals, I learn he's doing something big, something that makes his point of view crystal clear. He's ordering what might be the most extensive environmental review ever conducted, not just in his state, but anywhere in the country. Before they can get a building permit, the coal terminals will be rigorously evaluated, not just for their impact on local air and water quality, but also for all the carbon emissions from all the coal they plan to ship. Whether it gets burned in Washington State, China, or anywhere else on the planet. Hey, this is Dick Donahue with you this Saturday morning here on KGMI. This move by Inslee doesn't sit well with Craig Cole, a spokesman for the terminal company. The State Department of Ecology announced that they wanted a very, very broad scope of review that would include such things as the impact on climate change of products that are used in other countries. You know, I, I don't want to be facetious about this, but does that mean if we ship wheat to China that we've got to uh, measure the impact when bread is baked? All I ever read in the newspaper, online, TV is, you know, we want to bring manufacturing and production back to the United States, but it seems to me that we are doing everything in our power to chase it away. We don't need people from California or Seattle to tell us how we ought to vote in our local county council races. As all of you know, this is a huge race. It's not only a priority for Whatcom County residents, it's a priority for all of Washington State, the nation, and the world. The coal companies just dumped an additional $160,000 into their pack. But there's no amount of money that replaces what you guys are gonna do today. As the election in Whatcom County gets down to the wire, both sides are making a last-ditch effort to win people over. I'm a volunteer with the Whatcom Wins campaign for county council. Now this November, we have a really important election for Whatcom County. Thank you very much. Bye. It's Memorial Day weekend, and Chris Christie has kept his promise. The shore is open for business. Christie even sets a new Guinness World Record for longest ribbon ever cut. 
He sure knows how to milk the media attention. But he won't talk to me. We're on hold, needless to say. Two minutes. Three. Almost four. Kara, how can I help you? Hey, this is Mark Bittman. We spoke a month or two ago. You actually were going to get back to me with an answer about whether we could get an interview with the governor about Sandy and its effects on the shoreline. Okay, sure, Mark. Um, let me go ahead and circle back with our office here, and I'll touch base with you, hopefully, by the end of the week. But in Union Beach, not everyone is satisfied to simply go on with life without getting some clear answers on why the storm was so devastating and what the future might bring. Climate scientist Michael Oppenheimer delivers some unwelcome news. We're unlucky. In this area of the world, the sea is projected to rise faster than the global average. If it's four feet higher, which is what we think will happen in this area, if sea level rise is not slowed down by, by rather stark emissions cuts, then the 100-year storm happens every five years. And it is eye-opening, and I do respect it, the science behind it. It's, you know, it's fact. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not the sky's falling for sure. It's reality. And I am so sorry my husband didn't come, because I would like him to hear what the doctor said. Very frightening. We don't know what to do. We have to adapt to the conditions that we know we're facing now and will face in our lifetimes and our kids' lifetimes. I'm not rebuilding. I didn't get the funds to do it. After listening to you, I'm kind of glad I'm not rebuilding. It scares me a little bit more. I feel like the state put funnel cakes before families, and that's a shame. Yeah. I hope you take this not as a partisan remark, but it's true also of my state. New York has a governor that wants to be president. New Jersey has a governor that wants to be president. These people will be asked what they did to save people after Sandy. This is one way you can be effective. Your voice will be heard. It may not do you a damn bit of good no, no. after the fact, but the, the knowledge that you'll be there calling these people to account, they know that. The gov Governor Christie knows that. My Governor Cuomo knows that. Both of them are trying to state claims for having handled this situation well. You're the test as to whether they did, and you will be the witnesses. On November 6, 2013, just over a year after the storm, Chris Christie wins re-election in a landslide. Tonight, I stand here as your governor, and I am so proud to be your governor. It's a sacred trust that was thrust upon me and you on October 29th of last year. And on the battlefield, that Sandy turned this state into, New Jerseyans will never leave any New Jerseyan behind. As the votes for the Whatcom County election start coming in, Buchanan's up. up. Yeah. Ken Mann's up. Oh my God, Ken Carl Weimer's up. It's clear the environmentalists are headed for a big win. Oh my God! Oh, Rudd Brown's up. The election results virtually guarantee that a coal terminal won't be built in Whatcom County. It's a refreshing victory in what's otherwise been a tough first year as governor for Jay Inslee. The purpose of the work group is to recommend a state program of actions and policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As the work group created by Inslee's Climate Action Bill comes to an end, the Republicans don't even seem to think Washington state should meet its emissions reduction goals. I've heard two members of these committees to see it's really not that important to meet those targets. And I think it's going to be no, no, difficult. No, 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 you, you started this fight. Those numbers were pulled out of the sky. Those numbers were just goals to work toward. We are supposed to meet these goals. Does not everybody agree with that? I mean, seriously, 
what's happening here today is not being helpful, and I would appreciate it if uh, other members of the committee did not try to um, say that I am for or against or anyway. I asked no a question. I didn't receive an answer, so we'll move on. I don't feel like I have to. Let answer me put your a motion. It ends without the two sides coming to an agreement on anything. But instead of backing off on the issue, Inslee decides to circumvent the Republicans and do whatever he can to reduce emissions using his executive power as governor. Okay, okay. And he sets his sights on an even bigger goal. Oregon and California, Washington and British Columbia have gathered in San Francisco to sign an historic document. He joins forces with other governors and pledges to reduce emissions along the entire West Coast. We are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change, and we are the last generation that can do something about it. So today we're pledging our executive commitment, our executive policies, and our energies to defeat climate change. Just seeing that look on his face, he just lights up. Okay, we're gonna put him back. And I had the same experience, the same sense of joy at just seeing that that life form. Okay, buddy, there you go. Ah, he's home. And I really do want my grandson's grandson to have that same experience. There you go. <laughs> this very much is to me a legacy issue. That's how I think of it, and that's why we're gonna win this battle.